Hi, I'm Matt Sumo, um, writer, creator of The Bardic Verses. Uh, I've also written Dedication for Double Take Comics, and I have an entry in Deadbeats, uh, which is a Ringo-nominated anthology for a Wave Blue World. And you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. He is the creator of The Bardic Verses. I almost say Tales for a second because it is a, a long, fantastical tale, but it's uh, enjoyable as well. We're joined today by the ever talented Matt Sumo. How are you doing today? Good, man. How are you? So, for those that don't know anything about yourself or about this book, tell us what it's all about. Uh, sure. So uh, this book is, it's about a bard um, who, if people that are unfamiliar, a bard is like a, a storyteller in fantasy setting, um, storyteller, musician. Uh, so our character is a storyteller that comes from a long line of, of uh, warriors, um, of like barbarians, um, warriors, you know, people that are skilled in combat. And he sort of uh, fell in love with music and didn't really want to follow in the family legacy. Um, so he's kind of dealing with that, um, dealing with, you know, the the fame of his family and, and trying to escape that legacy. And, and basically our book is just him telling the stories of the adventures that he's gone on and sort of dealing, again, dealing with that um, that shadow of the family legacy. So uh, it's sort of an anthology. Um, you know, we sort of played it like each song is a different story in the book in a different art style, all drawn by the same person, uh, Pete Collins. Yeah, they're just different stories. Um, they could stand by themselves, uh, but they do all eventually connect as we find out later in the book. Well, the one thing I, I noticed right away was it it throws you into the story because you get a bit of a backstory about the character. You uh, start in the first song and, and you're just thrown into action. It's not like uh, you're you're just waiting to understand what's going on so so your pacing is amazing i love that fact and and the characters are very interesting and entertaining as well bards are really misunderstood characters when it comes to D and D. I think i think they're they're one of those characters that everyone just poo poos to the side and says yeah no i don't want to play that character who wants to be a bard Ew, it's like yeah. almost like you get the plague or something have you played bard characters in D and D? so i have not um i, I am actually not uh, that well versed in D and D, uh, Pete, the, who's the artist, Pete Collins, um, he has played a bard character and has played D and D for years. So he was sort of my Sherpa. We saw the bard character in the Witcher series on uh, Netflix, and we're kind of, you know, I was like, I love this character. Like, I wish they would do more with it. In talking to Pete, he was like, "Yeah, bards are like severely underrepresented." You know, like you said, like no one really wants to play as them, right? Because they're not they're not well versed in combat. Like, they 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 have some abilities, but nothing nothing fancy, nothing crazy. But the thing I liked about them the most is that they're the most like me as a person. Like, they're storytellers, right? Like they they're in the background. They're the ones keeping track of what's going on in the game and they're in their you know specific groups in realizing that these characters are so underutilized and again being storytellers uh, we kind of liked the fact that they were like an underdog um and wanted to tell a story about uh again one of these storytellers so we sort of crafted this book um that we're working on now the bardic verses about the bard um escaping you know his his family legacy so what is the most challenging aspect about writing for a character that you have little knowledge other than an amazing portrayal on the witcher series yeah. <laughs> um the challenge was like i i sort of had to ask pete a lot of questions i would stop and go hey is this is this good is this accurate is there anything that i'm missing is there something that i should add like it was a lot of that a lot of back and forth i mean luckily him and i uh, work together at the same day job um oh. so when we're you know when we have downtime you know we'll we'll just be chatting back and forth about the book and, and you know talking about ideas it's been super collaborative and, and very fun it's, a, it's an interesting um experience that i've never had in comics before uh you know mostly it's in comics, it's you write a script, you pass it off to an editor, they make notes, you you fix it. Then once once it's done, you pass they pass it off to an artist and you never see it again until it's in print, basically. So it's cool. Like I've I've gotten to see this the whole process from script to art and you know to lettering all the way through. 
You said it was a, a year long process so far to put this book together. Obviously, that's a long time to to get a book, and and obviously the pandemic, I'm sure, doesn't help matters in that that aspect. But were you energized about getting this book put together with Pete? And I think you have someone else that works with you on this. Yeah, we have uh, uh, Matt Crotzer, who's our letterer. Because COVID shut everything down, it was more for us to have something to do. We didn't have a timeline really in mind. Now we do because we're, we're coming to the tail end of the book. But this is something that we were just working on on the side in our free time uh, between work hours and, and things like that. It was just, you know, hey, we're doing this for fun. You know, when it's done, it's done. So we're pretty much ready to, to, to start getting the, the process going of getting it out. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being a writer? Man, um, if I had to, like, I guess I would say personally, I think the most misunderstood thing is that it's, it's not hard work, um, you know, or we do the, the least amount of heavy lifting, which uh, granted artists, you know, they do the most amount of heavy lifting, but there's a lot of things that we have to do on our end as writers. A lot of the stuff that I've done is raising the money to, or saving the money to, to pay for art, um, doing a lot of the marketing uh, myself and, and all that kind of stuff that, you know, you don't really think about until you're, you're putting the book together. You're like, all right, well, you know, once this is done, like, you know, we'll have to pitch it out. I, I have to pitch it out to publishers and see if that works. Or if, it, if, you know, if we're not pitching it out to publishers, we have to figure out a crowdfunding campaign. I think it's, again, like that we don't do uh, a lot of the heavy lifting that we just write the script and then it's on to the next one. And it's not that at all. Like this, this book has been living in my brain um, since we started it uh, over a year ago at this point. What did you draw from uh, as a writer to create your characters then? I think I use a lot of personal um, experience. So again, like this, this book specifically is about breaking out on your own and not following in your, uh, in your family footsteps, right? So uh, I think it was really important for me to, to bring a lot of that personal experience that I'm trying to you know, I have, I have very successful family members. Um, my sister is very successful as much as like, I use her as an example of like who I want to be. Like I also want to be my own person as well. So I brought a lot of that personal experience. Um, a lot of the feelings that I've had going through life uh, are in this book. There's a lot of uh, other personal things in the book that I've brought to it. I just try to bring as much of my own uh, experiences to any characters that I create and just to make the book feel that much more authentic. Is it hard being the black sheep of the family, so to speak? Kind of. I would never say that I'm not successful. I think I am. It's pretty cool to have been like a published comic book writer. It's something I've always wanted to do. You know, not a lot of people get to say that they they can do, you know, the thing that they've always wanted to do, right? I think I'm, I'm pretty privileged to be able to say that. I wouldn't say I'm a black sheep, but I will say that I do have like a chip on my shoulder where like I... You know, I feel the need to to be as successful as I possibly can be. And I try to bring that into everything, whether it's my day job, whether it's comics, um, anything I do, uh, I want to be as successful as I possibly can be. Um, again, just to, to be like, hey, like, I can do this too, you know. Uh, but it shows in your work too. I, It just and, sounded, and apologize for the question, it's just, it sounded like in you speaking about this, that that you're trying to prove yourself to your family as well as to yourself that you know this is a great profession to be in this is something that um creatively speaking is difficult but it's rewarding in the same sense the fact that you're showcasing your talents as a writer through this amazing book and that people are getting are taking notice of it is just is something that not a lot of people can say in their lifetime yeah i agree how many unpublished or half finished scripts do you have uh so believe it or not uh, not a lot. Uh, oh. I try to only like, if I'm, if I'm going to, if I'm going to write, if I'm going to produce, like I want something to show for it. Um, I don't like to sit on a lot of, of unfinished work. I think I might, if I had to think about this right now, I might have maybe one or two things, but in, they've, I've maybe shared them one way or the other somewhere. If I know I'm going to do something like for Bardic versus like, I knew I was going to do this. So we, you know, I was writing scripts and Pete was immediately drawing them. If I'm writing a script, like I'm, I'm it's because it's going to go somewhere or I'm going to, you know, 
pitch it, you know, I'm going to, you know, pay for the art and the lettering and then pitch it out or whatever the case may be. I, I don't like to sit on stuff. It's a long way to say I have things in like various stages of production, but the goal is to get it out there. Right. Um, and if I'm sitting on it, it's just going to collect dust in my hard drive. What was the hardest scene to write in this particular book? There's two of them. The dance sequence, the tango. Mm. <laughs> I, I do have to give Pete a lot of credit here because I kind of, in the script, like I was trying to write it and, and then like, you know, put dialogue in between. Uh, but I, for the most part, I leaned on him. I said, hey, dude, like we, I need this to look like a tango. And I also need them to have a conversation while they're doing it. So wh whatever you need to do, and I think he pulled it off very well. Later in the book, and this would, I would say this is the hardest thing I had to write. Later in the book, there is a full-on musical number that I had to write lyrics for. I am not familiar with, I mean, I, I can write a song lyric, but I had to write it in sort of like a Disney style. That was super challenging. I, my first draft, I read the lyrics back and they didn't make any sense. Um, they just weren't, they didn't follow any kind of tempo. They were awful. I'm actually going to be leaning on a, a friend of mine did a lot of like musical theater. So I asked her, I said, Hey, like when this is, you know, before we go to print with this, like, can you read these lyrics and offer me any like suggestions or like any fixes we could do to make these more like a song and less like some guy who was never written song lyrics before <laughs> wrote song lyrics. So yeah, that was incredibly difficult. Um, it's a cool sequence. Um, I'm glad it's in the book. I wouldn't remove it uh, for anything, but I never want to do that again. <laughs> Until the next book. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. You said you wouldn't remove this particular scene, but obviously you had to edit and remove items out of this book. What did you edit out of this book? Good question. Not a lot, honestly. Like this was something that Pete and I had, had just worked on again in our free time. There was a lot of stuff that we, you know, a lot of ideas that we came up with as we went along and we threw everything in there. I'm trying to think if there was like a story that we wanted to take out, but I, can't, I honestly, I can't think of anything. I, the, the beauty of this is I would write something in the script and pass it to Pete and Pete would go, Hey, like, I think this is good, but like, let's, you know, let's let it breathe a little bit. Let, let me add some stuff to this and make this sequence longer. I'm really fortunate to have such a collaborative relationship with Pete where he'll give me ideas. I'll give him ideas. The work isn't so precious where I'm not open to that, that kind of stuff. I love that, that form of collaboration and it's been, it's been great. So to answer your question, we really didn't have to cut anything. We just let anything that we wanted to put in there, we put in there. And it's been, it's been great. What's your writing kryptonite? Oof. Um, I mean, <laughs> as I said before, song lyrics. The other thing I would say too is uh, being descriptive. Uh, if you read the, the scripts that I sent to Pete, they mm -hmm. are not descriptive at all. Um, it's mostly like, hey, like, here's what we need to happen in this panel. Like, do your thing. He's always delivered. There was one sequence that I had to ask him to add more to it. I don't want to give it away because it happens late in the book, but I just said, hey, like, I need, like, that's good. Like, what you did is good, but I need more. Descriptions and song lyrics are the two worst. I feel like when I'm trying to be descriptive in a script, I'm not being descriptive enough. And then it's like, or I'm writing too many words. It's like a whole thing. It's a whole process. So I think I would say being descriptive for sure is my number one after song lyrics. Does writing energize you or does it exhaust you? Ooh, wow. Uh, that is an awesome question. Both with Bardic Versus, because we were doing our own thing, it was super energizing. I had so much fun writing it. I had so much fun. I, I had fun seeing it put together. I had fun when we had these, you know, crushing Kickstarter conversations um, about how much money we need to raise and, and all the logistics that are involved. I still had fun doing that despite that, you know, stressing me out. On the flip side, there's been projects that I've worked on that were work for hire that were exhausting. You know, that was one of those cases where you're writing a script, you're sending it into an editor, and then you're getting notes back, you're rewriting and, and, and et cetera. And then you don't see it until it's done. I don't want to, it, it was also fun, but it's exhausting in that it became work at that point. Right. You know, when you're not producing work that somebody else thinks is is good and they're saying, you know, this isn't good, like change it, that's kind of crushing. But I think, you know, all that goes away uh, when it's in print and you're holding the physical copy. I, I, say, I said that to Pete when Pete and I first met at our day job. 
I had kind of recruited him to do a pinup for this anthology that I was writing for at the time uh, called Kayfabe. It's about pro wrestling. He did a pinup. It was awesome. And I said, hey, man, I'm like, just so you know, when you get this book in your hands, when you hold the book in your hands, when you see it, you're going to get the bug. I'm like, you're going to want to do this. You're going to want to keep chasing that feeling of holding something that you contributed to in your hands for the rest of your life. As I said, it like as soon as he got it, it was that he got the bug and then we were off to the races. When it is exhausting, you kind of chase that feeling of, I know when this is all over and I'm holding the finished product of something that I worked on, it's going to be worth it. And it always is every single time. It's great to have a, a business that you can um, get into, especially with comics, especially with something that not a lot of people, at least in the early days, could get into. The fact that you've made it your career is is incredible, and you know more power to you to keep making these amazing books as well too. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? That's a good question. Um... It's an early experience. I guess, again, like seeing something in print for the first time, um, I had worked, so about 10 years ago uh, is kind of when I first entered into comics. Um, and, you know, I'd always read them as a kid. Uh, I, I do recall like reading Ultimate Spider-Man for the first time. And, and that sort of, that would probably be the moment I realized that comics were uh, were super important and uh, something I wanted to do because Brian Michael Bendis has this ability to write characters that sound like actual people. You know, it's not that um, kind of funky comic dialogue. It's, you know, it's legit uh, dialogue. Like he, he said he would sit on the train and listen to people talk. Um, and I, that's when I, when I read Ultimate Spider-Man, I was like, I want to do this. Like, I want to make people, I want to make characters that sound like me or sound like people that I know. Um, Cause it's fun. Like dialogue is a fun thing to, to, um, to put in a comic book, right? Like, it's not just that like, Hey, over there, like there's this villain doing this thing. Like it's just people having conversations. Um, so when I first when I first published, I did a one shot, a 22 page one shot, which is not available anywhere, thankfully, because it's not, um, it's not my best work, but it is my first work. And I can't, I can't slight it because it, it brought me to um, the attention of a publisher at the time. Um, they've since folded Double Take Comics. Uh, I sent it to them as like a resume, like, here's what I've done. Uh, you know, please hire me to be a writer. And they did to their credit. I worked on a couple of things. Uh, we finally, they finally landed on Night of the Living Dead. Um, and I did a, a, a series of books for them about a bunch of kids working in a grocery store during the Night of the Living Dead. Um, so I guess my first, my first comic, my first published work was sort of where I, I understood that language has power. Um, Cause again, like it, it, it opened doors for me that I never thought were possible. Um, and I sort of tell this to people, um, you know, when they're like, hey, should I do this thing? Um, and I tell people, listen, like worst, the worst somebody could say to you is no. Um, and then you're, you're back where you started, like nothing changed. You're, you're, you're not, your life is irreparably damaged. Uh, you can just move on to the next thing. Um, and that's what I did with, with my book. I sent it in. I was like, the worst they could tell me is no. And they told me yes. So, you know, I had nothing to lose and I didn't lose anything. I, I gained from it. But what are the ethics of writing these fictional characters that you create? Every character is a piece of me. I, I try to bring uh, as much as my voice to these characters as possible. Um, Martin, who's the, the main character in the Bardic Verses is, is the most, I think, of me, which is hilarious because the, the book I did for Double Take Dedication um, was about a kid working at a grocery store. I've worked at a grocery store for years as a teenager. So you would think that that would be the closest to me. But Martillon is the closest to me where, again, he's trying to strike out on his own. He he makes mistakes. He's not He's not a tough guy by any means. You know, he cracks jokes. He's funny. He's vulnerable. When you're writing these characters, when you're creating these characters, you're just putting pieces of yourself out into the world. And that's, it's interesting. Um, it's sometimes horrible because 
you know, when people reject your work, it's like they're rejecting you. And so that's always an interesting situation to have to deal with in, in, in comics. I try not to take it personally, but of course you do because it's your work, right? It's your, it's your, your baby. You're saying, you're putting it out and saying, this was a year of, of hard work. These are pieces of me that I, you know, I might not have, have shared with people. Uh, otherwise, you know, please love this. And if they don't, you know, you do take it personally, but at the end of the day, you have to remember that not everything is for everybody. So I guess to answer your question, you're, you're just putting the most personal parts about yourself into this product that you're share, you're then sharing with the world. Uh, so it's, it's challenging and, and sometimes soul crushing, but again, ultimately always worth it. I was curious about how you picked your names for your characters. Cause Martin is just a, is an interesting name that kind of just <laughs> popped out of the page of I did utilize that there was a, a Dungeons and Dragons name generator. <laughs> so I pronounce it Martin. I think Pete pronounces it Martin, 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 I don't whatever. However, he, we both pronounce it very differently. I it came out with that name and I loved it so much because it's such a, it, 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 like it's the perfect blend of like a real name Martin. And then just throwing that, that L in there, like makes it so much better. Um, and then I really loved, it also gave me that last name of sword hand, which I really liked. Cause it's like that old thing where your surname was like your occupation, you know, where like Smith like has that ties to like people being blacksmiths, like the last name Smith. I really liked sword hand because it, it just, it tells you like, Oh, this guy should be in a, like this, this warrior. And he's not. Um, and it, his father, who you see in the book is like this big hulking barbarian named sea roar, which is another amazing name. You know, you see him, you're like, wow, that, that his name makes sense. See, you were a sword hand. Like, what a cool, like, like Conan-esque name. And then you see his son and it's like, oh, like, here's this guy carrying around a loot. He doesn't look anything like his dad. So it just contributed. Like, it was just such a, a, a great piece that to contribute to the story that I just had to, to utilize. And then uh, some of the other characters throughout the adventures have just some really cool, unique names as well, too. So, <laughs> uh, honestly, it's... They're... That's the one thing I, I love about comics is if you get a memorable name and it sticks with you as you're reading it, it's just like that person just is a genius. Like I love it. <laughs> there's um I, I do have to mention quick, there's this character in, in what you read in the proof, it was the first story. It's gonna end up being the third, I think. Uh yeah. it's called a Maiden to Smite for kind of our riff on a Dame to Kill for the Frank Miller Sin City story. There's a character in there named Gary. He's the yellow goblin. He ended up becoming my favorite character in the book. And not to spoil it, but they do. He pops up again later in the book. Uh, he's my favorite character. He's my favorite character to write. Um, just this silly little yellow goblin character. I'm like a great name. Just Gary. Like he has the most regular sounding name. Everyone else has like interesting like medieval fantasy names. And there is just Gary. Like <laughs> it's just so <laughs> stupid, but I love it so much. Uh, next time uh, for the next book, you need a Bob. Yeah, <laughs> I thought about Bob. At one point, I thought about using a Bob, so I just might for the next one. I think in WoW, I had a, I created a, I had a pet character named Bob just because. Nice. It's so funny to use those like, like unassuming regular names like Gary, Bob. You know, just so like so interesting and, and stupid, but I love it. I am the siege breaker. I am the destroyer of worlds. Yeah. And this is my pet Bob. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly like, it, it's funny. I think the group, so there's, uh, the group is like Vram, uh, Joe D, uh, James that's spelled with an I, and then Gary. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so dumb. Oh. At what point are we good enough? Oh. <laughs> I feel like I'm in therapy. At what point are we good enough? That is a great question. I think, wow, I feel like I should be laying down on a couch for this. Um, Let's just hold, make sure you hold the phone up to your head if you're going to do Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. We're good enough when we've accomplished the things that we've set out to accomplish. All I ever wanted to do in my life was be a comic book writer, and I'm doing it. There's some projects that I have sort of on the back burner right now that once those are out there i think that would be closer to good enough there's some stuff like i you know obviously i'd love to write for the big two i think when you have goals that you set out to do 
and you accomplish them, like that's, I think when you're, when you're good enough, right? Like, I think when you're, when you're doing the things that you want to do and you're, you're creatively satisfied with that, I think that's when you can consider yourself good enough. Yeah, it's always a matter of uh, how do you improve yourself? How do you live your life? You know, are you, you know, a good person or are you struggling with something that you can't deal with at this point in time? And maybe you have to look towards the future for that. But when did your life change for the better? <laughs> um, oof, I'm, I feel like it, it I feel like it, it's life in general is ebbs and flows, right? Um, I feel like, so, you know, you have high points, you have low points. It's always, that's how life is always going to be. Honestly, and this is such a cliche answer. I think life sort of changed for the better for me when I, I started to write for, for comics. Right? I discovered like that the writers write the script, they send it to an artist, the artist draws it, et cetera, that whole process. Um, once I figured that out um, and I realized that like you didn't have to be an artist, to, like artists didn't write comics or some of them do, but for the most part, it was usually a writer writing a script. I feel like that's where my life changed for the better, you know, where I figured out like, oh, I could do this too. Like this isn't out of the realm of possibility. I think the coolest thing now is as we go, uh, you know, as the years progress, it's just getting easier to do, right? There's uh, Kickstarter where there was, never was before. There's Webtoons where you could just publish it online. There's all these avenues for, for creators to get their work out there that there wasn't in the past. Like it used to just be, you know, pitch one of four publishers and hope that it happens, or you have to go, you, you know, you have to go super underground, print out like photocopies and, and put them together on your own. There's printers now that, that can do all this stuff where there wasn't before. It's just so much easier. Now, I would say to any creator that's looking to do this, that, that isn't doing it, you owe it to yourself to do it. The other thing I'll say is life is so short. You owe it to yourself to pursue the things that you want to pursue, no matter what. And I get that life gets in the way, but, you know, find the time to, to write a script, find the time to find an artist, you know, uh, collaborate with somebody, like do the things that you want to do because, you know, life can be over in an instant, not to bring it down, but <laughs> it's true. Like you never know when it's your time to go. Obviously everyone makes mistakes in their lives. What is one mistake that you will never do again? <laughs> so many answers for this. Um, one I'm, I'm not going to say out loud, uh, but if you know me, you know what it is. The one mistake that I've made in my life um, that I won't do again is not being a great listener. This is a little bit more personal, but I think just being open to other people's thoughts and opinions I've run into some stuff in the past where, you know, maybe I, I wasn't paying much, much attention to something that I should have been. So just being more attentive, being more present is something that I think I need to be more aware of and not make that mistake of just sort of being wrapped up in, in so many different things and not paying attention to, to important things. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? Probably, if I had to guess, so it would probably be The Misadventures of of Matt Sumo. And not that I have a lot of misadventures, but I think there's a certain comedy to my life. Uh, I live alone. I live in like a studio apartment in New York. I work from home for my day job, which is very cool. Um, but I've been through a lot of like weird things in my life uh, up to now where like if somebody was reading it to be like, how, how does this happen? Like what, what is this year alone has been uh, super interesting. Um, I had a, like a, I got a really bad infection a couple months ago. I was in the hospital. Um, that was a whole thing. Uh, I got divorced early uh, this year. That was a whole thing. It's been a ride. I could say that from start to to now to present. People would be very interested to see like these again, quote unquote, misadventures that I've been on. Sounds like you already have the next comic series. Of yeah. <laughs> I couldn't do it. It's, oh. it's, it's, it's stranger than fiction. Everyone has one or two people that inspire them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? And I, I've mentioned her before, but my oldest sister, she's super smart. She was in high school. She went straight to college. She went to law school after that. Then she went back and got her master's degree. Um, again, super successful, funny, you know, has two great kids, my nephews. She was that person that I, I felt like I was always chasing after, like as far as like 
you know, being successful. And, and again, if I, if you spoke to her right now, she would, she would agree 110% that I'm successful. She was, was always inspiring to me. She never, you know, when she heard I was, I, I was writing comics, um, she's never read comics before in her life. You know, she's into like the Marvel movies. She's into the stuff that's in the, the zeitgeist. Um, but she would never sit down and read a comic, but she would sit down and read the stuff that I wrote, which is cool um, for me again, because she was that person that inspired me to just put the, my nose to the grindstone and do the work and see the, uh, the fruits of my labor, the way she did with, with school and, and her, per, and her career and stuff like that. So yeah, my sister for sure is my, uh, inspiration. From a professional perspective, you've written for, you've written comic books, you've written other works as well too, and you're successful in that, right? The fact that you have the Bardic verses coming out as well too, is an amazing, is an amazing accomplishment. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I would say for sure. I do consider myself successful. Uh, I, like I said earlier, there are people out there that, that have dreams and have goals and they don't pursue them for one reason or the other. And I get like life gets in the way, you know, you're, you're raising a family or you're, you know, you're working, uh, sometimes like 20 hours a day in your day job or whatever the case may be. And you just can't find the time. Um, I've been very fortunate to, to be able to do, to work on comics and hold a day job at the same time. You know, I was able to, to see my work in print. I was able to go to conventions. I was able to do signings at shops, you know, stuff I'd never thought I'd be able to do. So yeah, I would say I'm successful. Um, I think there's more I have to do still, um, to be even more successful. But as of right now, if, if God forbid my life ended right now, I would say, yeah, I was successful. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Oh, um, <laughs> I, how do I deal with them? You know, I, I let myself feel the, the sadness that comes with failure. I let myself deal with that, like on a personal level, but then it's, I, I kind of realize that, you know, the train keeps moving, whether you want it to or life, and, or want it to or not. And by the train, I mean, life itself, like life keeps going. Um, life doesn't stop and wait for you. Uh, the days keep passing, the clock keeps moving. So I have to keep moving too. You know, you give yourself a day to be sad about it or to, to be down on yourself about it, but then it's, it's onward and upward from there. Like keep moving, keep doing, uh, things, try to learn from your mistakes and learn from your failures and keep moving on because life is going to do that, whether you want it to or not. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. Either maybe it's your nephews, maybe it's uh, another person that picks up your book. They may want to become creative as a comic book writer or however they'd like to be creative. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I would say just by doing that same thing, like just putting the, doing the work, putting work out, uh, making yourself accessible, being a nice person, uh, that's one super big piece of advice that I got, you know, in comics when I first started. It's a lot smaller than people think it is. There are tons of creators, but I, you know, we all, we know, I know a lot of, of creators. Um, I've been in a lot of different circles of creators. Word gets around. Like if you're not, if you're not a nice person or you're bad to your, your collaborators, it, it, word will spread pretty quickly and you will, you'll have a reputation. So I will say like, you know, just be a good person, put, you know, create, uh, put yourself out there and then also leave the industry better than how you found it. Um, which is, I try to do that not only in comics, but in, you know, my life in general, like I just try to leave everything better than how I found it. Well, I do hate to say it, Matt, but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking. I want to thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. It was awesome. But before I let you go, uh, where can we find you on social media and uh, how can we support you uh, online? Sure. So uh, I'm everywhere. I have the same handle everywhere. It's at Matt Man Begins. So that's M-A-T-T. -T, and then Man Begins, like Batman Begins, everywhere. Instagram, uh, Twitter, Kofi, like any social media, that's my handle. My website is msumo.com. Uh, but specifically for Bardic Versus, uh, our website is below, as you can see, bardicverses.com. Uh, the Kickstarter, when it launches on September 8th, uh, will be at tbvkickstarter.com, which is the initials for the Bardic Versus. And yeah, like just follow me on the socials. I'll be talking about Bardic Versus for the next two months.
and just getting the word out there and for the Kickstarter. Well, that's awesome. Uh, again, Matt, it, it's a pleasure having you on. I want to have you back on for sure. Let's talk more about either some past projects or future projects as well, too. I, your, your wealth of knowledge and you're a very entertaining person. So Awesome. Thank you so much, Kurt. I appreciate it. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank Matt again for coming on the show. You can find his work, of course, on the social medias he mentioned, as well as the website down below. And you can find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And as I say every week, thanks again for listening, watching, and Everyone has a story to tell, and it's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks again. See you next week. Hey, all, Kurt Sasso here from Two Geeks Talking. If you like this video and these quick clips here, make sure you take a look at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. Make sure you hit the like button and subscribe as well. Hit the bell to make sure you get notifications, of course, from videos like this here. Thank you, everyone, for listening and watching over the years, and keep listening and watching for new and exciting interviews with talented, creative people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Thank you so much.